Welcome to We Build Great Apartment Communities, the only show dedicated to the process and strategies for transforming apartment buildings to thriving communities. I am your host, John Brackett, and welcome to the show. All right, folks, welcome to another great episode of We Build Great Apartment Communities, the only place where we talk about taking apartment buildings and turning them into amazing communities. I have here another great guest. His name is Jacob Blackett. I know his name sounds very similar to mine, so that alone should tell you that this is going to be an amazing show. But Jacob, very unique background, uh, someone that I'm very excited to have on the show because he has... Um, you know, currently he owns about 1,100 units across the nation, but unique opportunity to get insight from someone that has um, been through the entire cycle, right? From acquisition to capitalizing projects, um, to managing projects, to then disposing of those assets. So uh, I'm very excited to get, to get into the show because of that reason. You know, we're speaking with someone that has literally managed the entire cycle of an asset. Um, and uh, not only that, but has been actively involved in every single aspect. So get ready for an amazing show and some great dialogue and questions. Let me introduce you folks to Jason, invite everybody into the conversation. So uh, Jacob is a real estate sponsor and software entrepreneur who currently owns and manages over 1,100 multifamily units across a portfolio of $190 million. So he started with single family homes and quickly switched to multifamily properties and specializes now in raising capital online. So we're going to talk a lot about the capital component of the multifamily business because that's an area that he has built a platform around and he's, uh, I think, done a, a really good job there. He also is, uh, has built uh, quite a bit of expertise in that area. So very excited to get into this conversation. Jacob, welcome to the show, man. Thank you very much, John. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Awesome, buddy. So, you know, I'm very curious to understand, you know, from your perspective, uh, usually we go through the cycle of, of an acquisition. We go through the life cycle of an investment, right? When we're on this show, we start with acquisitions, then we go to raising capital and then management. And then finally, at some point, disposing of the asset, right? You're, you're a, a great guest because you are someone that has sourced your own deals right? That has raised your own money. Um, you also manage your own assets. And then you've also have been involved in actually selling or making decisions as it relates to the sale of assets. But the area that I want to start with you now is the topic of raising money. Okay. Because uh, that is the lifeblood of pretty much any investment. And you have experience with debt. You also have experience with equity. So you're familiar with the balance sheet. So talk to us a little bit about your background, right? How you came into this space. I know you started with multifamily, then you transitioned into single family. Talk to us a little bit about your background, your experiences, and then let's get into the capital side of this business. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. So uh, I started with single family homes and, uh, and it was doing, doing uh, fix and flips and wholesale deals. I graduated college in 2012 and came out of the gate doing wholesale deals and, and fix and flips. So uh, my early experience with capital was uh, as a senior in college, I had about 10 grand in the bank that I, I worked through college, saved, put away. I had good, good I stayed in state for college. I didn't, I didn't, uh, you know, go, go out of state. So tuition was very reasonable, had some good scholarships. So I, so I had 10 grand nest egg. I maxed out some student loans to get another 10 grand. So I had 20 grand in, in working capital when I, when I graduated. And so I went directly into single family wholesale deals and fix and flips. And, and I did that for a couple years before getting a little bit burnt out on the transactional process of that. Right. And, uh, and, and to your to your point related to raising capital, I early on on those wholesale deals and fix and flips, I created a lot of joint ventures. Uh, I, I created I, I sourced capital from friends and family. Uh, my earliest investor was actually my grandmother, 
So <laughs> she, uh, yeah, she, she unfortunately uh, had some uh, lip, kidney failure from a drug that she took. And so she had a settlement that, that uh, fr from that experience. And so she uh, was able to provide me some capital to work with and then really just friends and family and then, and then kind of meeting people around town. And, and once you, once you get some deals behind you, some track record, then, then you can kind of extend that network out to other people, other professionals, working professionals and right. really grew the, grew the investor network from there. Awesome, man. Awesome. So when, when you started with friends and family, what were some of the biggest concerns that you had when you were starting out raising money? Yeah. So it, it really comes down to trust, right? And, and that's why you start with friends and family, because uh, without, without track record, without experience and expertise, it's, it's really hard to get people to trust you. They, they have to know you as a person. Uh, they have to have experience with you in other facets of life, right? So, uh, so really, um, those those early those early days, uh, I I I had that I had that trust component, and then for um, for for those outside of that family and friends network, uh, it was a hard sell, and it only became easier, quote unquote. It's never easy, but uh, easier once I had more and more track record. I think a lot of people uh, that are outside your friends, friends and family want to, you know, they, they meet you, they realize you're a good person. Uh, okay. And I, I trust this person, but it, is my money safe? Like what is, what have they done? Right. Uh, and, and, and what so, are your results, uh, right? What are your results? Yeah. Yeah. What's, what's the track record. And so, uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's kind of, how that developed and, and over time, uh, as the investor network grew from those five to 10 people to, to tens of twenties, uh, to now, uh, now thousands, uh, almost 5,000 total, uh, investor leads in my contact database who have registered with me, uh, about 600 active investors. It, it's really nice at this level because, as long as you execute on your deals, as long as you stay true to your business plans, uh, your investors, you get a lot of word of mouth, a lot of referral. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a snowball effect. And so the last year or two, I've, I've enjoyed quite a bit of that kind of snowball effect, uh, word of mouth and, and organic, uh, organic growth on the investor side. Awesome, man. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you expand upon that a little bit, right? So you talked about um, you having roughly around 5,000 prospective investors in your database, roughly around 600 of them are active, which is great. So talk a little bit about how you created that, right? The system behind that, that drove those leads. Okay. And of course, those leads then mm -hmm. converting to um, investors that are actively participating in your projects. Yeah, it, it's a great question, John. And I always looked at my website as my catch-all. So uh, my website, it, for me, it's extremely important. It needs, to, it needs to, when someone lands on your website, it needs to look clean, professional. It needs to have your messaging, right? So if, if you land on my website, holdfolio.com, for example, it says very, very clearly invest with us in multifamily real estate, right? And it has a button to view investments. So from a messaging perspective, it's very clear. Uh, and, and I think that helps, of course, to convert traffic visitors. Uh, also, word of mouth. If, if, someone, if someone's talking in their friend circle and, and they mention something about this investment they made with Holdfolio, and, and so now this person's, you know, they Google Holdfolio, do, do you come up when, if someone Googles your company name, right? Are, are you there for them? Uh, it, when they do find you, uh, is your, is your website messaging clear, right? So, so being able to capitalize on that kind of word of mouth and referral traffic is huge sure. and, and something that we've really focused on. So, so what is the name of the website? So we can include that in our show notes for you. 
Yeah, yeah. My oh, my real estate company is holdfolio.com. Holdfolio. There we go. Okay. Holdfolio. Yeah. I'll have my staff include that in the show notes so people can can check it out. Holdfolio. Okay. So okay, great. So for you, your your primary capture source has been your website, right? Uh, so you, yeah. I've- of those 5,000, I think it's about 4,900 leads. Uh, every single one of them have visited my site and registered. And so, so this is where kind of the plug-in uh, with Syndication Pro, my software company, comes in. Right. So the, the website is built through WordPress. That's a, it's a WordPress website, and it has, you know, view investments and login and sign-up buttons but the infrastructure behind that process of how someone can actually sign up and create an account. And, and I'm sure we'll get into this, but eventually invest with you and and have a dashboard that that whole infrastructure is done through syndication pro. Um, The investors don't know it, right? They, they see Holdfolio. It's all branded to Holdfolio and the company, but uh, the the infrastructure uh, is provided through that software company. Now, are they, are they registering then through your website or through the other product that you have? I know it's integrated, but where are they registering? Yeah, so they'll, they'll uh, hit the sign-up form, and when they register, they're, they're registering on the Syndication Pro platform, okay. right? Yeah. It has the whole folio logo, and it has your company logo in it. And to them, it feels no different, but, uh, but natively that it's a different database. Okay, great. So, so let's, let's continue walking through this example. Okay. Cause this is great, great for audience. Um, and I'm learning a lot too, which is why a uh, fascinating conversation, right? So 5,000 to 600 active. So let's talk a little bit about the nurturing process, right? Because it's one thing to be able to capture you know, 5,000 leads, it's another to be able to nurture them into active investors that actually trust you and that want to do business with you. So talk a little bit about your nurturing process and how you're able to convert that, you know, 5,000 to six, that's about a 10% conversion rate, which is pretty good, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Uh, and so what happens is, is at the end of the day, I don't invest with anyone I don't accept any investment dollars from anyone unless I've had at least a conversation, at least an opportunity to learn more about them, their investing experience, their goals. The, the last thing you want to do, right, is, is get an investor who, who is the wrong fit into a deal. For example, they misunderstood. They thought that it was a short-term deal. They only do short-term deals. And so now they're invested in your deal you're looking at a five-year horizon and they're freaking out about trying to get their money out. Right. Right. So uh, early on, we spent a lot of time. We're getting, we're getting these registered leads on our site. We spent a lot of time uh, emailing them, calling them, trying to figure out, trying to figure out how we, how we get this relationship kickstarted. And so what we do, it's actually fully automated. So the investor will go ahead and sign up. Uh, then they'll see, once they sign up, they'll see a, uh, a nice message that says something to the effect of, uh, you know, we only invest with people we know to view current investment opportunities, please schedule a call. And so it has a schedule a call button. It's linked through with Calendly. Uh, directly to uh, directly to our calendar, so so they've registered. They see the message. Okay, you know, quick introduction call, schedule the call. Uh, those who those who schedule the call obviously will get in touch with their high quality uh, high quality lead. People who are just window looking, low quality leads, they they probably won't schedule that introduction call. Right. And quite honestly, we used to do a bunch of follow ups and call out to them, maybe text them. We don't do any of it now because we found that it didn't move the needle. If that's smart, that's if, really really smart. Yeah, yeah. If if your leads are quality leads and they're going to be potential investors, they're going to end up scheduling that introduction call. And so it, it's really taken a lot of work out of our sales cycle. For example, so so I you know what I like that and I and I understand the process. So as you as you move them through your funnel that initial meeting, you know, you're, you're, you're creating some automation such that you're actually 
pulling people through the process, but you're pulling qualified people through the process because you're requiring that they opt in to you, which is a scheduled call. And that's the first layer of interaction, right? Mm -hmm. So I really like that. I really like that. So once that first call is set, in this case, it's through Calendly, okay, mm -hmm. what does that conversation look like to move yeah. them to the it, next step? It, early on, it was really thought through, you could call it a script, basically, like, man, what, what do we want to tell these, in, these prospective investors? How do we want to tell them that we're legit and, and about us and tell them everything they need to know? Uh, we've since scrapped all of that. It's, it's as simple as this. When we jump on the call, we tell them that the, the purpose of the call is to get an opportunity to answer any initial questions they might have, and also an opportunity for us to better understand their investing experience and about them. So why don't you go ahead and start with that? Can you tell me a little bit more about yourself and your investing experience? right? Just kind of get them talking. And sure. then, then you, you build rapport, just, just pull out a couple of things that they're at, that they're telling you about and, and right. just kind of learn, learn a bit more about them, let them talk. And then you flip right back to them. Okay. Well, based upon what you, what you know already, because we have a website, it's got messaging and, and they can learn about us based upon what you know already, what initial questions do you have? Right. And so now it's back into their plate. So they're thinking, well, that's great because I do have a few questions. And, and so they ask, they answer the, they ask the questions. We concisely and as possible answer them, basically serving their needs, focusing on what they're thinking about. Uh, and then, and then from there, it's, it's, uh, it to wrap up the call. It's basically telling them that uh, most of the time it's a good fit, quite honestly. Rarely will I have a call where the person is maybe abrasive, for example, uh, just, just really, maybe I'm not getting the feeling that I would like to do business with this individual. Right. Uh, it's very, it's very rare, but it right. does happen. Uh, sometimes you learn that it's just not a good fit where, you know, they're, they're just looking for a different type of investment. Uh, maybe, maybe they're just too green. They're, they're just too novice. Uh, for example, maybe they're not accredited. So uh, you're kind of looking, well, are they sophisticated Right. And so you're trying to kind of figure out if this person's sophisticated. And, and so if they're really green, novice, haven't invested, uh, maybe they just don't have very much in savings, then it's probably, like, oh, well, you know, this probably isn't a good fit. Uh, but, but those are the kind of minority of the cases. Um, most of the time it's, it's explaining that uh, now that we've had this call, you're, you're, you'll be verified. Um, typically we have a reservation process. So most of the time we don't have a deal that we're raising money for, right? Most of the time we're right. kind of in between deals. Right. So when we don't have deals, we have reservations. And so a reservation is a forward looking, it gives them some details on the types of deals we do. It might have a document, kind of a case study of a deal we most re of a recent deal that we did. So they can get some, get a taste of what, what we do and what's coming up. And then they can place a soft commitment uh, right then and there. So, so over that call, we say, Hey, check out the reservation. Our deals fill up quickly. So, so if you, if, if you think that this might be, if, if you want some priority in our next deal over anyone who doesn't make a reservation, go ahead and place a reservation. That'll, that'll get you on the wait list. It'll get, get you priority in our next deal. So it's basically a call to action, kind of getting them halfway in, uh, halfway in the door. And, and that's huge because, as you're building those reservations and you're looking for your next deal, you can see, you know, I have 7 million in reservations, right? I, my next deal is probably going to be a two or to $5 million raise. So I know I don't need to focus on investors. I need to really focus on deals. And so that, that's been really instrumental. Okay. Beautiful. So I really love the way that you walked us through that process. Now here's the big question of the reservations that you set or the soft commitments that you set. Mm -hmm. What is the conversion rate of that to actually investable dollars, right? Dollars that get placed in, into deals. Yeah, it, it's a bit of a bell curve given time. So, uh, so those reservations that have been made, made over the last 30 days, for example, uh, you, we, we may be looking at 70% 
conversion, like, I mean, really respectable uh, conversion on those. And then that just may drop to potentially 50% for those reservations that may be three or four, five months old, right? So uh, it, it's pretty good. At the end of the day, I've <clears throat> never been able to raise anything less than 50% of my my reservations. Uh, and yeah, and, and those reservations create basically this effect of fear of missing out. Right. Or the yeah. investors kind of get, you know, gets them, gets them really tuned in. You can provide right. updates, keep them, keep them in the loop. And then when you do have uh, the deal, it's, it's coming to fruition. You know, you're going to raise, you can publish like the offering memorandum. So you don't have legal documents, right? You can't take actual subscriptions. You're waiting on those, but you can still feed the investors some, some, some details, some bits of information so that they can kind of digest and figure out if this is a deal for going to be de- good for them. Sure. And then, and then when you do open up the raise, it's first come first serve. You pick, you pick a day, you know, Wednesday, noon, Eastern, first come first serve. And, and typically our deals are fully subscribed within, within a couple of days. Interesting. Very, very interesting. I, I really like that. So here's the, here's another question then. So it sounds like, um, you know, you're, you're, subscribing 70% of your, of the investors that um, have given you a soft commitment through your reservation mechanism, right? Which I really like for the, so for the first 30 days, the commitment level is really high because the engagement is high, but after 30 days, I think you said three to four months go by, then that drops to 50%. So it sounds like there's a huge opportunity to maintain engagement so how have you since tweaked your system to re-engage the bottom portion that's falling off from a lack of engagement? What's the, what have you dialed in to create that or to improve that? You know, I, I think that it's not so much engagement as it is timing. So it, mm. investors, they, it, it's a timing game. You know, they, they, have, they just got cashed out, right? And, and so now they're looking to place. And, and so it's, I think it's more of just a timing game and, and being having something available when, when the time is right. Okay. Now what percentage of that, of your investors of the 600 or the money that you've placed have had an in- interest in exchanging into TIC interest, right? So folks that are looking to attend their one exchange, you know, mm-hmm. typically those dollars are not going to be able to meet your subscription amount. Right. But, a portion of that can and usually can contribute to whatever the investment requirement is. Mm -hmm. Uh, But usually it has to be fractioned into a a tick, right? A tenant common interest. So what percentage of that of say, for example, that 70% that you actually allocate towards an investment, what percentage of that will come to you and inquire, Hey, can I now take my dollars? Am I able to, I'm in an exchange. And can I make an investment, right, mm-hmm. in this in this project via 1031 exchange? Yeah, it's it's pretty low. And actually, got it. This the 1031 is typically sift sifted out on that introduction call. So, and even before the introduction call, potentially before they register. So, so we don't do tenant in common, right? So, so it's actually uh, part of our frequently asked questions on our site. Uh, can I invest through a 1031? And so uh, we actually say, unfortunately, we don't accommodate that. So potentially we filter out even on the site level, uh, those with some 1031 money looking to register. Uh, but, but yeah, I I'd, quite honestly don't think I've even experienced um, someone who has made a reservation and then they've got this 1030, it, it's 1031 money because usually we get that sifted out front. Now, I ask that question because for, for us, we do, but we only do it for existing clients, right? Folks that have been with us. I have investors that have been with me for 10 years, mm-hmm. some even longer than that, right? Where I've watched their kids matriculate through elementary school, middle school. Now, some are going into high school and now some are in college and some have graduated from college already. Interesting, right? Investing but, in your deals. Yeah, investing in our deals. A couple of them have put, put their kids through expensive universities investing in our deals. In fact, my first partner was my CPA. And his daughter, um, I think she just graduated from Georgetown and one from nice. the University of Dallas uh, investing with me over the years. Great guy, great family. 
But, you know, I asked that question because uh, for me, I wanted to make an accommodation with folks that have been with us for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, it was more of an accommodation that we then realized there's a place for that, but as an accommodation to existing investors only. And it's worked out really well. We've had to learn um, a little bit about structuring that and reporting that, right? Because there's some complexities with the accounting side. Because technically mm-hmm. now you're managing through several different entities, yep. same investment, and and we've had to, we have to, we had to get smarter at doing that. But it's really interesting to me. It sounds like the, you know, you're qualifying that segment of the market out, which I fully understand, and then really just focusing on um, folks that are liquid and they're ready to make a decision forward, right? Right, right. And, awesome. Uh, I love it. Yeah. I love it. So, so Jacob, I'm going to, I'm going to transition right now. In fact, I'm going to just recap what you said, right? Because to me, it's really fascinating, man. I I really love how you have articulated your process. It's really simple and executable and very clear, right? I've learned that over the years when things are too complicated, I just don't do it because almost impossible to execute on. And I've, I've learned over time that someone's ability to be able to clearly articulate what they're doing in very simplified in a very simplified manner really helps to define their expertise right so it makes you even more credible because you can clearly explain and walk our audience through exactly what this looks like in very simplistic terms you know i i I always tell my kids i go hey look Um, have you ever been, oh, so this is, you'll, you'll love this, right? Have you ever been in those meetings where people will explain something and they'll say, they'll, they'll say that then they'll follow up with the question. Doesn't that make sense? Does that make sense? And most people out of fear of, you know, out of fear of, um, not knowing or wanting to be that person that people say, Hey, well, you should know this, right? Mm -hmm. The typical answer is yes. When it really doesn't. <laughs> so I always tell my kids, I go, Hey, look, if something doesn't make sense, just say it doesn't make sense. It, it's okay. Right. Just say, uh, no, it doesn't. So I, I find it ironic that we have more people willing to agree with something for the fear of looking bad than simply saying, you know what, that really doesn't make any sense. You know, can you repeat that? And in many cases, when it doesn't make sense, it's just because it doesn't make sense. <laughs> There's no magic yeah. behind that, right? So in, in your case, man, I really appreciate the fact that you're able to clearly explain this and walk our audience through this process. So I'm going to repeat what I just heard, okay? So the first thing is your first capture mechanism is your website. And you use very clear messaging to tell your audience exactly what you do. And in this case, it's multifamily. But you are very clear about the fact that you know you are placing investments in multifamily property. Okay, those are the first two things that I heard. The second thing is now walking your audience through your pipeline and qualifying them along the way. And for you, you use a scheduling tool to do that. You use some automation, which is inviting them to a meeting, but ultimately you're sending out an invitation, okay, to learn more about you, which I love. It's an invitation. And they're ultimately taking the next step, right? So they're initiating the next step and following through on that invitation. So now you have someone that's motivated and serious about engaging in a conversation about investing. Okay. Then the fourth step is now it's about understanding suitability, which you do that through that, that conversation, but it's also about aligning that with creating suitability and also creating demand, right? Based on what that, that uh, it, based on the, what the investor's interests are, okay? Uh, and you do that through a reservation mechanism, which I love. And I don't know what that looks like, but I understand the concept, okay? And in doing so, you do two things, right? You align that investor with, you align that investor with potential investments or projects, in this case, real estate projects that are suitable based on what they've described. And two, now you have created demand that you can track, right? So you can track what your pipeline dollars look like for the next upcoming investment. Did I get it? Yeah, you got it. And it, awesome. it's, awesome. All, it's all on the framework of technology. So 
it's all in one place. It's, it's automated, streamlined as possible. So that you're not running around from different platforms and CRM here and, you know, mailing service here and it's, it's all in one. Okay. Now here's the big question. Okay. Now everything that we just described, that backend process that we just described, is that process created on syndication pro or did you, so in other words, is that process created on syndication pro to then be integrated with the website? Yeah, it's, it's created on syndication pro. So that's pretty smart, man. Yeah. So my, myself and, and everyone who uses syndication pro can follow those, that same sales funnel. So yeah, once the investor registers from the site, uh, they're in that, they're in that, in that ecosystem in the dashboard and, and they're now interacting with your company through, through the syndication pro platform. And is the automation, the email automation set up in there or can it be set up in there? Yep. It's set up fully customizable. Uh, if you didn't want to, you know, you control the messaging. If you didn't want to have that introduction call, you don't have to, uh, for example, yeah, it's, but, but yeah, we give those tools for, for, uh, is that people. process created or is it already created where, for example, you just turn on a switch or is it something, for example, that I would have to create, um, yeah. you know, within that software? No, it's, it's created, it's nice. created. And then we, and then it, the ability to customize it is there, which would include turning it off as well. Okay. So here's a big concern with investor operators, right? It's okay. I don't want to co-mingle my investors with, with other, other investors, right? The big thing is, is confidentiality. And we're also um, literally guaranteeing that to our investor base, right? That, Hey, I'm not going to be sharing your information with others other than me. Mm -hmm. So how do you create assurance or, or how, what are your, what are the assurances that you create for operators out there that um, you're not sharing their database, right? Or in this case, their mm -hmm. investor uh, leads or data with other parties out there, or even with what you're doing for that matter, right? Cause that's just yeah. a real concern that people have. Yeah, it's, it's important. So privacy, uh, we're not big data. We, we don't do anything with, with our clients' data. So our syndication pro clients, they sign up and, and use our platform. It's under their company. Uh, it's under their umbrella. They, they own and, and, ha and retain rights to their data. We, we don't do anything with it, but host it. And we provide the secure uh, environment, the encryption, the bank level security uh, for them to, for them to, facilitate that entire process. Okay, beautiful. So now we're going to pivot, right? So now we've talked about leads. We've talked about creating demand, figuring out how much demand in dollars we have in our pipeline, right? To be able to place into an investment. So now we're going to talk about actually placing those dollars. So the first question that I'm going to start with is wires, right? So is this system such that, you know, when we're working through our offering documents, we actually have the offering documents completed, right? Mm -hmm. The memorandum, the subscription agreements, wiring instructions, can that all be done through syndication pro? It, including from the, the investors, yes. From the investor's perspective, it doesn't get any more simple. It, the entire investment process is handled on, on through the platform. So mm -hmm. your investors will sign the subscription document, they will then be emailed and presented with the funding instructions. So your wire instructions, for example, uh, they can they can print those instructions from that page. They can email them to to someone else right from that page if they if they need to. And then they will also tell you their intentions of if you only do wires, then they'll tell you when they plan to wire, so that you have those bits of information on your end when you're managing you know the funding process, uh, and then. If you do wires and checks, they'll, they'll choose, you know, it'll say, how are you investing in wire or check? And then, you know, when do you plan on mailing the check or the, the wire? And, and so, yeah, all those instructions and customized instructions as well are provided. Okay, beautiful. But just to be clear, the investor is not able to initiate a wire through that, through that platform, right? I mean, they have to use their own, they have to go direct to their bank 
send a wire out. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Makes sense. Yep. Makes sense. But you can provide instructions uh, through the portal for the investor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Beautiful. Exactly. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. So now we, we, we get that, right? So we have a mechanism now through which we can collect funds. And the only reason why I was asking about the wires being generated through the system is so, for example, with our bank, we have everything set up to where when a wire is sent, we provide them with instructions so we can easily track the wire. Wire gets sent, we get notified through our cash management system that the money has hit the account, right? Mm -hmm. And very clear instructions so we can start accounting for those dollars, okay? And so that's why I was asking that question. And so the second now component of that, okay, we talk, so we walk through the process of collecting dollars, getting dollars wide into the account, right? To be able to fund the investment. Now we're gonna talk about every investor's dream, which is reporting in every operator's dream, which is good reporting, right? Mm -hmm. Now, nothing beats a great accountant, okay, which I've had to humbly learn over the years. So once we've, we've had a great accountant, and we do now, someone extremely experienced in, in um, multifamily operations, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, we find ways to move, move forward with that person on a long-term basis, right? Because very, very good. Mm -hmm. We have a team around that now, and it's taken some time. But now here's the question, okay? So reporting, extremely important to investors. So I know that through your products, people can log in, especially an investor, they have their own unique login, okay? To be able to view, uh, in this case, the reports or likely how that investment is performing, okay? <laughs> But now from an, in, from an operator standpoint, what's important to me is that I pay out my investors on time through distributions. So am I able to send out wires as an operator reflective of the distribution obligations that I have to my investor base? Yeah, yeah, so with, with the updates, you're able, to, you're able to craft and send updates. You can have those emailed to your investors. So if you have, uh, it's a rich text editor. You can really make it beautiful. It has your company logo on it. You fill out the, the, the update from the month or the quarter. You can make attachments. So if you had some reports or, or any supporting documents, you can attach those. Those updates will be emailed to the investors in the deal. Uh, so they'll see the actual update. They won't see a notification there's a new update. They'll actually see the update in their inbox so that they can get exactly what they need uh, right then and there. The updates are stored for historical reference. So, so from, from your perspective and the investor's perspective, they can always have historical reference of all the updates that have ever happened. Uh, and then when it comes time for distributions, you can, uh, you can import distributions. If, if, you know, if, if you're handling your dis distributions a certain way and you're sending, sending money uh, through your property management company or your bank, you can just import those distribution details so your investors can get notifications about those payments. Um, alternatively, you can use our system to calculate those distributions for your investors. So it'll break up, if your investors are getting 50 grand, for example, it'll break up the 50,000 per investor based upon their ownership. Uh, and then what we are currently developing to be launched by the end of the year is your ability to actually pay those. So you'll, you could actually pay via ACH uh, or check. That's huge. And it's completely automated. So yeah. it's, it's all built in uh, just a one-stop shop. That, that's really great. That's huge because, you know, when I'm thinking through what you've said, the biggest thing that I try to prevent is duplication of efforts, right? It's like I don't like uploading a bunch of stuff to a system, K1s, working through our, our quarterly reports, getting all that ready, then having to make distributions on another system, then going back to your system, for example, and then having my accountant actually put in what those distributions are. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's, it's still important to the investor, but it's a very efficient, inefficient process. So it sounds like you have figured out how to integrate the two. So who's taking on the wiring risk? Because I know the banks don't really like that when a third party offers to send out wires on behalf of someone else, right? Yeah, it, it's, we've taken our time, quite honestly. I, I, I explored this 
three or four years ago and have continued to meet different merchants, different processors, really uh, different banks who, who, are, who, who would be willing to do this. Uh, and, and so we've settled, we've settled on, on a current, uh, on a current provider. Uh, and so we feel, we feel really good about that. Um, it's, it's a really secure environment where John, you, you, you select your payment account, the money, you know, the account that you'll be sending distributions from, you verify that account that you actually own it through either you, you do an instant verification or you do micro deposits. So, so the account is verified that it is your bank account. And then through our system, the, the investors will go ahead and provide their distribution preference uh, and, and it's, you know, their, their banking details. So that when you're at that step of making that payment, you have your bank, it's verified, your investors have all of their details in. So when you go ahead and send that payment, we'll, we'll go ahead and send those ACH uh, payments out uh, and or checks as well. So uh, if you ever, you know, IRA custodians, for example, sometimes they just don't take an ACH payment. So, uh, so you can do it uh, via, via check as well. Awesome. Check in awesome. the mail. Yeah, for, for the custodians, I can see that, right? Because they want a paper trail, but they also want to make sure that if for whatever reason, the payee is not titled properly, that they can return the check. So I, I totally yeah. get that. Interesting. Yeah. That's really clever, man, that you, it sounds like you guys have spent a lot of time thinking through this. You can tell that I bumped into some of these issues in the past, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, managing 600 investments myself, doing those distributions quarterly, I mean, it, it's something that I have dealt with for many years. And of course, all of our clients and firms, it's a big, it's a, it's a big selling point. Uh, and I think a big time, time saver. So it's a big value. Awesome. Well, I'm going to, we're approaching the end of the show, Jacob. This has been perhaps one of the best conversations that I think I've had around the process of raising capital, right? Uh, because we, we literally have talked about raising that, how to raise but then more importantly, how to make sure that, um, as I always say that private equity has feelings, right? How to, how to keep our, our investors uh, not only happy, you know, right? The, the, the results really is what makes them happy, but it's creating access and improving the experience along the way that I think helps create that engagement. And so I think you've done a great job of discussing um, really a solution based on your own experiences, right? That you've created based on your own experiences. And, you know, um, a lot of what we discussed are things that I've run into in the past and have had to overcome with different solutions. So really cool. I really, really appreciate that. So now here's the big question. How has COVID-19, and we're in that environment now, how has that forced innovation for you and, you know, um, I think one of the great things about, actually, I'm going to let you answer that question first, because I have a couple of other follow-up questions that pertain to equity and debt that I know our audience will really find value in, because it has to do with, you know, using that information to identify demand in the marketplace, right? Mm -hmm. um, but how have you had to evolve now, uh, be, just because of some of, some of the challenges or some of the opportunities rather that we're going through in this marketplace yeah the the big one of course early on was uh creating new systems and and new ways of leasing properties uh, for example so on uh, since we are hands-on with our management we do that ourselves some of those some of the really early early days of the pandemic we were really rethinking the way that we lease properties so there's of course uh, 3d or virtual walkthroughs that and i'm sure you've seen them you kind of click through the unit and it, and it kind of gives like a little click through walkthrough uh what we actually found success in doing is actually getting a camera out there with a, with the leasing agent from the property and doing a more personable walkthrough with the leasing agent. So it's actually not just a virtual click through tour, but it's an actual person. They're talking about the community. They're talking about, you know, the, the, the amenities they're showing, they're showing the unit. You can actually see a person walking through the unit and highlighting it. And so that's one of the innovations that, that I took is that I'll probably never pay for, 
3D click-through tours anymore. I'm just going to have, we just have our leasing agents go out to that, those specific unit types, shoot an actual video, uh, and, and we saw a lot of good response from that. Uh, and, then, and then, of course, more than ever is, is tightening up on um, collections and, and understanding, having empathy with, with residents, um, providing guidance. So all, of course, in, the, in, in the, the past, we always tried to make sure that any tenants who were struggling on rent knew of local systems and, and, uh, and, and ways of getting resources. Yeah. Yeah. Resources. But, uh, the pandemic had brought that to a new, a new level because there's always, always some new assistance or some, some new way for someone. So, right. uh, So that, that's brought a lot. And, uh, yeah, I mean, those are probably the the two that I think of initially. Uh, and then of course the, the infrastructure of raising money in a hands-off environment where, you can shoot video, you can post all the details on the investment. You don't have to go meet investors over coffee. Um, that's been ever prevalent in terms of creating an infra, uh, a uh, ecosystem that your investors can get everything they need, self-serve place investments without having to potentially meet and greet or without and having like we mentioned a website and 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 an, a uh, presence online so that you don't have to necessarily go to those uh events and and rely on rubbing shoulders shaking hands um you you have a a, a website that actually that actually converts so i think those are all all really important important things for yeah that's great you know you you, you said something there that really took me back to some of the innovations that we've had to make. And your comment was using in-person video, right? Uh, So when we started our management company, it was about two and a half years ago, and it was birthed out of the challenges that we ran into with third-party managers. And it was actually uh, one of the best things that happened. But, you know, the directive that I gave my team is I said, okay, we have to be able to create a company where we can operate virtually from anywhere in the nation. Actually, it was anywhere in the world, but I had to scale that down to anywhere in the nation first. So when, when COVID-19 hit, we were already about two years ahead, right? But I decided to spend a lot of time and energy around leasing because I thought that that's where, that was the value that we could create the most, even if we had to outsource to a third party that I wanted to be able to control the leads that we were driving to an investment to lease up. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for me, it was me. That means, you know, it was me flying out to that property, literally living there on site until I mapped out this process. Right. And one of the big learning lessons was how people presented, especially in very competitive markets was huge. So understanding how to position a value proposition was really, really big, right? Depending on the market. So for mm-hmm. example, if you are a smaller com- community and you're surrounded by a lot of big communities, you have to have a great value proposition around a small community, right? If you're a big community competing with a lot of smaller communities and other larger communities around you, you have to have a great value proposition around that. And those really, that's where the presentations came but now here, this was the big lesson. Okay. So to your point, we had to get really good at generating leads through advertising. Okay. Scheduling the lead for an appointment because in very competitive markets couldn't risk losing the lead. Right. Right. So scheduling the lead for an appointment and then the presentation initially we're having someone do the in-person presentation. We did away with that and then had someone doing a, virtual presentation except the customer was using their video facebook right and then we were walking them through the entire tour with them on the phone man our Mm. our our um leasing rates our booking rates our closing rates literally shot through the roof when we did that and so when you kind of talked about that it made me think go oh man that's that was a big that was a big one right but the reason why I wanted to master that is because if, if, you know, say, for example, we purchased a property in North Carolina 
and we have really good on-site management there. My biggest learning lesson from third parties, man, is they're horrible marketers, right? They're not very good at mm-hmm. advertising. They're horrible marketers because they don't view that really as part of their role. And anytime, um, like with these larger companies, they rely so heavily on automation of advertising and marketing, right? Through a lot of these third party systems out there, the leads are diluted, man, by the time they get to them. Yeah. So we wanted, yeah. to, we wanted to fully control that because I felt that's where the, the, the greatest value that we can initially work on to keep our properties fully occupied, right? So uh, really interesting, man. I, I love the fact that you, you touched on that and it, it brought back some memories, you know? Jacob, this has been an amazing conversation. You know, we are at the end of the show. I kept you a little longer than expected, but the conversation has been so amazing and so valuable. I know that our listeners are going to be able to capture just a lot of golden nuggets from this. I've I've literally filled a a page full of notes, you know, on this. Uh, So, hey, the last question before we, we, we transition and um, yeah. Allow you to share with our audience how they can get a hold of you is what is the one question that you have for me that you feel can add some value to our audience? So the one question I can ask of you. Yes. How do where are your resources who are setting those appointments uh, for the for the leasing agents? Are they on site or are they centralized? They're all centralized, man. We have to centralize them to make it efficient and to bring our costs down. So they're all centralized. The other side of that too is we have to centralize them to train them, right? So that if, if one of them moved or left or whatever happened, that all that knowledge stayed there. But more importantly, we systematize the entire process so that we're not people dependent, rather we're process dependent. And that was a big shift that happened mm-hmm. two years ago. And um, so we centralize them for that reason. Yeah, you don't want your on-site leasing agents spending time, you know, getting calls and on the phone. You want them on their toes, ready to go meet a prospect or in your case, jump on. I love that point. Jump on maybe a video, Facebook video to, to just give them the tour instantly. Yeah. So. Well, when you, you think about this, right, every single on-site manager that you've met, okay, what are they ultimately doing on site? I mean, what are they really getting paid for? It's usually, it's, it usually it's, it's customer interaction, right? in keeping the residents ultimately happy, okay? But that usually means being able to respond to challenges, right? And being able to keep people engaged on site, okay? Mm -hmm. But the other side of that too is really what they are for the community truly is they're the ambassador for your vision. When it's all said and done, an on-site manager is the ambassador for your vision, So we've adopted that philosophy, which is why we created this podcast, right? Because it's an extension of the message that I give my team. Our -hmm. message is we build great apartment communities and we improve how people live. So everything was built around that message. And so ultimately what I look for in an onsite manager is someone who can ambassador our message. And then we take people and we build them around that person to be able to deal with all the maintenance requests. So we filter all the maintenance requests and to be able to schedule and set, right, all the appointments. And I, I, I ideally, depending on the skill set there, to sell the lease. And man, that has made a huge difference. But you have mm-hmm. to also have to realize that I spent months on site figuring this stuff out, right? So yeah. I'll yeah. you can help me refine you can help me refine some of my um, private equity process. Okay. And I'll help you on the um, leasing side. Sounds like a deal. <laughs> Sounds great, man. How do people get a hold of you, Jacob? Uh, quite honestly, easiest way would be email jacob at syndicationpro.com. Beautiful, man. Thank you so much. You've been a tremendous guest. Uh, Information has been amazing. And I know that there's probably at least $2 million worth of information on this show. 
And I hope that that gets monetized by the majority of our audience. Thank you so much, bud. I wish you continued success. Yeah, thank you so much, John. It was, it was a true pleasure. Yeah, pleasure's mine, buddy. Thank you. Thanks. Clarity of Purpose creates our greatest competitive advantage. When we transform apartment buildings to thriving communities, we improve how people live and create assets with high profit margins. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this up with a friend. I'm John Brackett, bringing you things you can implement right away.